Greetings and salutations, all you beautiful people, and welcome to another episode of Art of the Beholder, a show dedicated to all things eclectic in the world of arts, where we do deep dives into deep cuts and help you understand why damn things matter. I'm your host, Novo Day, and today we're going to be talking about art in traditional fine art, focusing on Francisco Goya's The Black Paintings. To hash it out, I am joined by guest Alexandra Parsons of Alexandra Parsons. Parsons.com. Miss Parsons, welcome back to the show. Hello. Thank you for having me. <laughs> as always, as always, we love, we love Miss Parsons' input analysis and, well, her impressions of her mom. We're a big fans of those too. So, yeah, we are coming together today to talk about Mr. Goya and the Black paintings. So, Francisco Goya is considered one of the most important Spanish artists of the late 18th and early 19th century, considered the last of the old masters and the first of the moderns, whereas his black paintings are a very special part of his history, as they were never really meant for public consumption, as they hint at the inner psyche of Goya's mind and perhaps not only his spiraling into madness, but maybe a rival. Now, before we can discuss, of course, we need a little background. Francisco José de Goya y Lucentes was born on March 30th, 1746, in Fuendera Toros, Oregon, Spain. And though he rose to the ranks of his professional career, even becoming a prime court painter, which is the highest rank in Spain, mind you, he, however, became very disillusioned by the political and societal developments in Spain at the time, becoming more and more hermetic, eventually living in complete solitude. And what is also known but not exactly clear, he acquired a severe and undiagnosed illness in 1793. We know that, uh, at least historians know that he acquired something, but they don't know exactly what that thing was. He was 47 at the time, and unfortunately, this illness left him deaf, which uh, equally greatly affected his work thereafter. His paintings becoming darker and darker and darker as the years went on, which leads us to the black paintings themselves. These were painted circa approximately 1819 to 1823, right before his death in 1828. They were, they were applied on oil on the plaster of his walls. So mind you, these were paintings with oil put on directly on the walls of his home, which is, this is another testament to why this was probably not for the public eye for exhibition things of of that nature and i will uh, put a pin in that because i'm going to touch on a little bit of an, an extra thesis if you will and uh, as we get into the discussion section his home was called uh, the cuenta del sordo or the house of the deaf man because he actually purchased it from a man that was also deaf and him being deaf himself at the time, that's how the name of the house stood to this day, as far as historians go. There are 14 pieces in the Black Paintings collection, though there are a possible 15th one, and we'll talk about that in the discussion section, as historians argue that one of them got misplaced and is now the 15th one, is very consistent with the other 14. And that's in New York, whereas the 14, of course, stayed in Spain. So, as I said, they were never meant for public display or exhibition. But 50 years after his death in 1874, they were taken down and transferred to canvas, which, in addition to the aging process of time, just general damage from this entire process, of course, the loss of paint and, this, and the subsequent need for restoration, the pieces themselves were significantly altered for preservation. Now, today, if you want to see them, you can, and they are, and they are on permanent display at the Museo del Prado in Madrid, Spain. Now, before we hatch it out, of course, we need a word from our sponsor. This episode is brought to you by the novel The Entropy Sessions, a tale of loss, love, and madness, and our past, present, and future relationships with technology. Find it on Amazon and as an audiobook through Audible. Your support helps us continue our journey. Now back to the show. Like our other shows that involve paintings or artists and shit like that, uh, we normally, you know, we'll start with style or things of that nature. Because there are 14 to technically 15 pieces, and we'll touch on all 15, uh, we're going to dive right into the pieces themselves and talk about, obviously, his color theory and the themes and all the shit, you know, that we normally build up to, but as we're working through the pieces themselves. So we're going to start, number one is Saturno 
devorando a, a su hijo or Saturn devouring his son. Now, I wanted to start here because this is actually a little shout out to um, Nerd Writer on YouTube. Uh, he does excellent YouTube um, video essays. And this is he did a whole piece on just this. And I remember seeing that and thinking, my God, it is quite nightmarish, grotesque grotesque and i you know i'm drawn to it in maybe a different way and this is probably where i'll tee you up um miss parsons to come in is i you know these pieces are not beautiful you know we uh me philip and and buck talked about uh hr giger and we talked about how the grotesque and the horrifying and the scary can be kind of beautiful in a weird way mm -hmm. whereas these pieces are not that at all they're alluring but in I got a way I would call forbidden, you know, where something that we weren't supposed to see and it gives it it gives it like a mystery and mystique to the inner working of of Goya's mind. And it creates this forbiddenness of like, what was he going through? Because could you imagine that? Could you imagine kind of going into a descent of madness and putting those things onto your walls to live with. I feel like of all the things I, I read and, and listened to, um, you know, biographies on them, they never talked about the, the psychology of living with your demons in your home. No, I agree. And that's something that I visualized a lot while looking at these paintings of him just kind of mumbling to himself and it being like a scene in one of those historical movies where he's like, I need to paint this on a wall, you know, like, <laughs> get out my demons. Like, and some people, some historians say like he needs to exercise he's like exercising his demons out onto the wall that he was battling with and then did you also like I think this one might have been in his dining room. I didn't. I didn't a deep dive into the like location of all these. I know that uh, that you know that that adds. That's a good point because that adds to the mystique and the the mystery and the lore and legacy of what these paintings have become because they were uh, his home was supposed to be two levels and they were supposed to be on the walls of all these of the multiple levels where some historians are saying they they're like I don't even think that Goya made these paintings because at one time or at, at a time in his history it was only it was known that he only lived on a single level home and the mm -hmm. second edition wasn't added till later so people think that some of these pieces were done by his son so there's so mm -hmm. there's so much mystery even there but you know just looking at something like saturn devouring his son it's just it it is haunting it is it's very haunting i remember some when i went to savannah college of art and design and like we had to take i think in order to get a bfa you have to get at least like take nine art history classes and this was like one of the first ones uh, and i remember it being so disturbing and you want to look at it <laughs> yeah i th there's just um so this has actually been um saturn devouring his son has been uh um, touched on throughout history a lot mm -hmm. of other painters have painted a piece similar to this even goya himself has one like it's like a sketch it's not a finished piece of uh a what looks like a saturn devouring his son i think the difference one the difference here is a lot of the depictions are showing like a little baby or an adolescent child whereas this one is clearly a full-grown man and, it, and that's even disputed too because of the shape of like the buttocks and stuff people sometimes think it's a woman so they don't know and so to me i always you know bring it back to what i tried to analyze what the artist was going through and usually when most people it's almost impossible to not put yourself in the art mm -hmm. i would imagine that saturn is devouring goya in this case oh i never thought of it like that Ooh, that's why we hash it out i never i just looked at it as very like oh it's classic roman god of saturn originally greek titan chronos in mythology and based on um you know zeus was the only one that escaped right so like um I just went into like my, cause I'm Greek like this. Oh yeah. That's classic Greek mythology. Mm -hmm. But yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense to think that he is, he feels like he's being devoured by something that is greater than him. He's getting older. He's, you know, he's seen a lot of hardship. Um, he's seen a lot of war and he probably yeah. just feels like he's being eaten away because of his illness too. So that's actually a really great analogy. Yeah. He, uh, you know, when you actually just read a bio on him, you know, obviously we're focusing on the black paintings today, but when you read a bio on him, it's crazy to see how kind of famous he was even in his time and how, how high he got, uh, you know, he rose the ranks 
but then how how much of a descent into his feelings on you know the inquisition at the time and the government at the time and his is almost extreme hatred for those things and i feel like we're seeing them in these pieces and that's a probably a good segue to the color theory itself because we're seeing a lot of the same style and 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 usage going on through the rest of them so this is a good essentially primer for the rest of the pieces as we go through them so we're seeing a lot of of course they're they're called black <laughs> for not only face only thematic reasons but also complete face value um, color theory reasons so the scenes are very dark they are black right so most of the color in these pieces are black a little hints of gray brown this color that I had to look up it's like a it's like a golden like tannish taupe hue called ochre uh, color and then you know he does use a little bit of white just to give um, a light source to to the pieces almost always in the top left hand corner um, and if there is any accents and this is a perfect example of that uh, there's only very very few uses of reds and blues and greens and they're usually accents in this case it's the red blood of the person being devoured let's move on to el perro the dog so first thing when i look at the dog is there's such a sadness to it because um both me and miss parsons both have a dog i uh my dog is is Miles. And what's your dog's name? Boba Fett. <laughs> Boba fucking perfect. Uh, um, I'm and looking so, at him right now. He's yeah. jumped. He just jumped on my bed. <laughs> oh, okay. All right. Hey, Boba Fett. Um, so what is dogs? You know, we've humans have always had a, a, a close relationship with dogs and dogs at the heart of, of how we see them is just happiness. You know, we love our dogs or dogs love us. It's just pure unadulterated happiness. But when you see the actual piece, the dog, it is bleak sadness because it's just the head of a dog like looking over something like it could be like a hill or a mountain or something you're just seeing him look over this this structure and he's looking at something and now this is where a lot of historians differ there's like a shadow that's created with uh, the dark browns and taupes and, and gold colors and that is that you can interpret that as there is a evil presence there a negative presence that the dog because if you zoom in on the dog he looks distraught he looks scared and things of, of that nature but historians will also say that this was just a byproduct of how you know the fucking aging process was and how things were changed when they were taken off the walls turned into canvas and restored i agree with you i also um watched this really cool short like little documentary of an art historian who went around in um where this was showcased in madrid and she talked about a couple of the paintings yeah and they they said that the art conservator that had a little more creative input than they actually like what we wouldn't be able to do these days and there used to be two birds there mm. um and the, that maybe and that he just covered over it um and some say like is he sinking is he just behind a mass yeah um, that was the other argument that he is actually in something like a quicksand and this Which is, is void, so again that is like you know he's being not devoured by Saturn but devoured by the Earth like essentially death. And it reminds me of like it reminds me of Arteo. Is it Arteo and um, the Rending Story where the horse is like, in, <laughs> like the I don't remember the name, but yeah, I do. Oh man, I <laughs> I, I loved the Never Ending Story. We can go on a little tangent there. You know what's yeah. crazy is uh, since I follow pop culture a lot for these shows, the the rights just got lifted, and now there's a bidding war from like you know warner brothers or paramount all these studios to buy the never-ending story to i'm assuming remake it which i i don't know i'd probably watch that i'd watch it i love the never-ending story but that there's like a couple memes out there about them the horse was dying and like how where did when did you think you needed to start therapy and i was like that scene <laughs> <laughs> And I was like, I was so traumatized. Uh, oh, that is, is, yeah. Was so that the it, first one? Like, and the, there was the quicksand and yeah. I mean, they come back at the end, but that's what this, the dog, this kind of reminded me of. And um, Goya's, 
he does that classic, like it's the eyes and all of his paintings. And he does it with the dog too. You're just like, Oh God. And the ears are pulled back. And it's just really heartbreaking. Yeah. He does this, uh, what's called this like, uh, energetic, almost erratic kind of brushstroke style with these. Cause if you look at his other paintings, he can go into detail, but remember this was purposeful. This was by design to put the, the paint on the canvas a certain way. Right. And there are these 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 big, long stroke like things. And we'll see more. um, We'll see more of that when he actually is painting people because the people look ghoulish. They look scary because it's not clear distinctions of eyes and a face and a mouth and things like that. It's it's this kind of blurring effect with all of it. And I think it's a, a let's go ahead and move on to one of those with piece number 3 on our list. Remember this was uh this was just this is arbitrary, right? So originally these name these pieces had no name, no chronology and um his he had a, actually a friend of his a painter or a descendant or something like this some sort of association to Goya uh, named these pieces and historians have probably given it a, an official chronology. I I just put it into, you know, my own chronology so don't send me your hate mail send it to send it to alexandra Mm -hmm. thanks (laughs) (laughs) so uh, let's move on to number three that is uh dos viejos or un viejos un uh, y un friale that's often uh, just called two old men now this depicts a a man with a beard with a like a cane and the and in the main in the middle kind of the foreground and then another man whispering into his ear i you know what's crazy is i wish they did a little more interpreting when they were giving this names because that is not a man on the right that is clearly a demon or the devil or yeah it's it's, very demonic or biblical exactly very demonic or biblical it reminded me of one of those like new old testament stories of like one of those like and this is like I grew up Catholic and I should know this, but I don't anymore. Um, yeah, one <laughs> what of the does demons- it say to you then? What it like if you were to interpret it? You know, if you if you didn't if you didn't even read about this, you know, beforehand and you had to. Well, you could do both, you know, your interpretation post the research. But I had like I had a first impression and then I had a second impression after I did a little research. What were yours? An old man being tempted to like maybe exactly. end his, his, yes. end, end his life early or to like something in some type of demonic temptation. That is that was exactly to a T. My first impression was this was yeah, this was the devil tempting man like this, this. This man could be like interpreted as all of mankind and that there's always been evil forces in nature that are tempting man, you know, with putting their even driving him mad. We're seeing stories like that all the time. But after I did my research, a lot of people and I almost can interpret this the same is that there was an evil force that made him deaf, that this was a, a distinct reference to his him becoming deaf with his illness Mm -hmm. and that's how he interpreted or that's how he it came out to be in the painting yeah it it also kind of reminds me of that like you sell your soul to the devil like so he had all this fame and success yeah and somehow he thinks that he's paying for it now uh uh, perhaps actually that i have didn't think about it that way yeah perhaps because yeah he you know he like we said before he rose to fame and then he had i think the illness was the beginning of the end and in his eyes you know Mm -hmm. It's funny. I mean, the human condition is so fascinating because a lot of people, it depends on the personality, the personality type as well, because someone that may already have psychosis, be it bipolarism or depression or whatever the thing is. Yeah. When something like that happens in their life, it can exacerbate that psychology, whereas maybe someone that doesn't or has other kinds of uh, mental health, uh, you know, progressive uh, type of uh, minds, they take something awful and turn it into something good. You know, there's plenty of of famous people that yeah they've lost a limb or they've gone deaf or lost their vision but it it actually pushed them to becoming better Mm -hmm. Uh, whereas this case it it is not the case at all (laughs) it pushed him to be to go to go further into his descent of madness which is classic for a lot of artists like they need to release their inner dialogue and the inner pain to be able to get it out it is a it is a i mean i've done that with my when i was grieving i had to like do a whole painting collection and it really Mm. was it's a form of like art therapy but they didn't have that verbiage then but this man literally was going probably insane in this big house just being like who knows what was happening in his psyche yeah the art that's a good way to put it the art that it's very therapeutic it's cathartic 
and it, it helps us when we put ourselves into the art and, and or channel those demons into art. Number four is uh, Hombres Laindo or Men Reading. Um, this one is, um, you know, I think at first glance, it's very tame compared to the other works. Uh, but I think there is some deeper social commentary here because a lot of people would argue that, again, we're, we're seeing a lot more people in this piece. So a lot more of that blurry kind of brushstroke style that he created created with his dark paintings and the men again look kind of ghoulish like we're seeing characters like on the far left that uh, because he's used so much of the actual black in the black paintings they don't have eyes you know and um they're so it's a it's a group of men hunched over reading a pamphlet historians consider this an interpretation of how essentially the hand of the government you know the all powerful hand is always you know essentially changing the the rule book book you know changing laws changing you know changing things that affect us at the bottom i agree yeah he had a lot of disdain for that right a lot of disdain for like, oh my god yes the current he, government at the time he when, it with the fiery passion when i first looked at this painting i was like is that man enjoying himself too much in the background like what's happening there <laughs> he's like oh yes read that book he's like, uh women <laughs> laughing is is probably closer to that interpretation this is like a segue to that and I was like, ah, oh. this was like his comfort with like more of the surrealist brushstrokes and the and the paintings that he did had a more this one had a more surrealist look to it. Yeah, and 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 he touches. I mean, obviously, with our first one on this um, list, we already touched on yeah the mythology. Uh, mm -hmm. renditions but he does that a lot uh, we haven't gotten to them yet he does he touches on a lot of these fantastical or mythological stories a lot so that's a, that's a good uh, kind of uh, introduction to how we'll explore those a little later so number five is uh, Judith e Holagernes or Judith and Holofernes now this is another story a famous story and his I mean as much as the subject matter is dark so you have to know a little context here so so Judith uh, in this in the story of these two is killing and beheading Holofernes and Holofernes is, can be looked at as the head of the government. So that's, again, Goya being like, I fucking hate <laughs> this entity that is politics and government and uh, these people, this very small you know, class of people that are controlling a bigger, uh, lower class of people. And so we need to behead that that snake. I've seen pieces like what's crazy is this is kind of tamed to other pieces I've seen where it's actually showing Judith full cutting into the neck of of Holofernes. I, you know, with this one, it's it's like it's like after the fact kind of thing. And since he doesn't use a lot of reds or other color theory in this, you, you have to just you have to kind of know your history. I think that's what historians already had to do. They kind of looked at it and like, OK, this is ex obviously what he's depicting here. No, I agree. I I love the um, woman in the background who's praying. No, that's uh, that's Holofernes dead that is wait yeah wait. that's supposed to be hall of fairness so judith is hold, holding the sword she killed him uh and so yeah that's supposed to be hall of fairness so yeah that's like uh, we, oh now, i read that it. they were praying i read somewhere that that he was that person is praying in the background and it looks to me more to like they're him. on you know like when a police you know like you know svu like does like a like a chalk outline of someone it looks like they're on the ground with their you know their head i don't think obviously they're not completely decapitated so in this rendition it's probably just like the neck was slit kind of thing uh but yeah it looks like they're down and their hand is is like right by them so they're flat on the ground essentially is how how i interpreted it but it's open to interpretation oh I guess no you that's see it the other no, way that's cool i've, I've heard so i read or i w watched one of these like a bunch of stuff and they were saying the person's praying in the background and you see the gold around the hands um that could be one interpretation but now it's like very interesting i'm looking at a different perspective the first thing i noticed about this painting is because they say how these probably none of these paintings were probably finished this one looks very unfinished to me he could have added more of the red you know because he did it for saturn mm -hmm. so um and yeah a lot of these well and a lot of these these pieces like i said in the intro were changed remember this wasn't ever supposed to be put on canvas so of course they were going to be damaged going from wall to canvas 
And then they had to be, you know, other painters had to restore them too. So there was things that were not only uh, taken away, probably with the um, the changing of the pieces, like literal location, they added to them. And we'll, we'll talk about that with a uh, uh, fight with cudgels here pretty soon. But before we get there, uh, yeah, Miss Parsons hinted at uh, one I think we'll have a lot of fun talking about, and that's number six. Uh, Mujer de Neyes Resinda, or Women Laughing. And in this piece, uh, we are seeing where to begin we're seeing a couple of old hags <laughs> laughing at what i assume would be goya masturbating right in front of them but there's people that uh interpret it as they are also masturbating with him i think i i would probably when i first looked at this first impression was yes he was i i think the ultimate societal uh not the ultimate but a very very important societal downside is the the concept of being shunned or shamed or laughed at and mocked and I think we've all, especially in modern times, we we know that we know that more than ever. Like people are bullied online, things like that. And you know, you could fucking put one thing on Twitter, and then you have like a mob of people saying you know just like shitting all over you. And so, just I mean that that concept of uh, of group shame has been around forever. And I that's that's what I got out of this that um, this poor man is being laughed at for whatever he's doing. Yeah, no, I agree. And the the la- the void, the classic in the background, the lack of any content except for these three figures and his hand on his crotch. Um, yeah, I also read that too, that some are saying that they're both masturbating or one of them is masturbating. I'm thinking maybe they're prostitutes. Yes. That's, that's what that's, I was... That's often considered the the reality of what's going on as well. Uh, maybe he actually gets off on them laughing at him. Who like, who could... Who knows? I would love... You know, it would be so cool to be able to be talk to him and be like, he's like, actually, you guys are all wrong. <laughs> well, that's the thing is, you know, um, you know, kind of going back to my sub thesis of... You know, these pieces are not beautiful or um, sexy in, in any kind of, uh, you know, thematic or, or categorical way. You know, they're often off putting and um, uh, things of that nature. And the only the, the only reason I, I found I found myself drawn to them is the forbiddenness of peering into this man's mind when we probably weren't supposed to, honestly. And I could also see the complete opposite of him not having any explanation of saying like not not only saying, no, you guys are wrong. It's like, I don't know. I just made them. And it's you, the audience, that is interpreting them. With this painting, too, you, I mean, I, and even in his br- brush strokes, even in his brush strokes, you can see like the madness in it. And I, I've always been an artist who would like look at paintings and be so captivated by just the brush strokes mm-hmm. because you're like, oh, that's the actual brush stroke that the painter made. Like, that's right. so cool. And you can see it in this. And then, like, the, the middle woman who, she's the scariest glaring glaring at him and it's i like, couldn't it's, agree more like it, it's almost like i mean it's clearly a person but there's a there's a monstrousness to her there's a like she is a creature she's she's unhuman um this actually just popped into my head right now did you ever watch devil's advocate devil's advocate with uh keanu reeves yeah but there i think there was some goya paintings in that movie but the creatures when he would see their faces they're actually demons kind of looked they like would yeah painting. they would like shift Suddenly yeah, with like it was very really old dated CGI. Yes, yeah, <laughs> yeah, and but so many, so many ghoulish stuff was I think inspired a lot of by of Goya's these paintings and his sketches that he did. Oh yeah, there again, uh, we've used the word haunting a lot uh, throughout this piece, and that middle woman's face looking at him with that smile is haunting uh, through and through. Um, let's move on to number seven, una menola or la leocaria, and then it's or it's just often considered uh, in the West Leocadia uh, or Leocadia or however you pronounce it. Now, this one definitely you need a little history lesson. So he, um, after his wife died, which probably added to his his misery and his kind of descent into depression and madness and, and all the things we've been talking about, he did take on, there, it's never been confirmed, but it's often uh, cited that he 
had a younger lover that was like his uh, assistant or, or handmaid and things like that. And that's Leo uh, Kadia. And this is her here. But the thing is, is like, I think, again, at first, it's just a it's just a woman in a dress kind of like, you know, leaning against like a like a, you know, a piece of rock or a piece of the landscape. But upon closer inspection, again, we're in a he could have picked anything, but she's in a black dress. So when you think of a black dress, you think of a funeral. I also same. And I saw that it was like some people say it's a burial mound. So yeah. like, Oh, I didn't. Yeah. I didn't think about it that um, way. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, and just basically an anticipation for his death. Yeah. That's um, yeah. There's really not too much uh, analysis or stuff I wanted to talk about here. Uh, it's, it's a lot of the same with the color theory and the look of the piece. And it just looks, it looks worn and beaten and weathered and uh, it's just sadness and car. Now, man, <laughs> But I love the blue. You guys love this show, don't you? Listen to I right love, now. But then you see the blue. There's like, yeah, there's the hints there's, of traditional color in it. That contrast, yeah, that I really like. Like so with the dog, it's all monochromatic browns, right? Even though it's really sad. I think it's probably yeah. one of the most beautiful paintings because it has like a lightness to it with the colors. And this one has similar the monochromatic creams, and yet she's wearing a black dress that she's grieving. But then you have this little ray of hope of blue in the background. <laughs> So do you, you use the word beautiful. Do you, do you find beauty in these pieces? Yes. Yeah, I do. Oh, wow. Yeah. Cause I, I don't, I, I find, I, I find that there is an alluring element, like I said, mm-hmm. but not in the form of beauty more probably in the form of, of honestly, sadness, melancholy and depression where, cause that's a, that's a human condition too. We, you know, we can't appreciate the good without the bad. Mm-hmm. And I, I think there's something so, uh, yeah, drawing from just, um, it draws me in terms of it's it's it it's sadness you know but that that can be in a i guess a something that can be magnetic too in art Mm -hmm. and all you know um musically speaking sometimes those are a thin line and we could probably see that in a lot of other artistic values and mediums that uh, beauty and sadness are sometimes uh two sides of the same coin do i find the topic Beautiful. I mean, it's more so the thing I find beautiful is the applique of it and the color contrast. And Mm. as an artist, like how it was, how he portrayed his feelings and his psyche onto it is beautiful. Um, Not so much as the sub, not so much as like these ghoulish faces. Yeah, it's disturbing. It's not in your traditional sense beautiful. It's more so in the, as an artist, respecting like what another artist has created is beautiful. I see. Okay. Well put. Well put, Miss Parsons. I try. Uh, let's <laughs> and succeed. Let's move on to number eight. Duelo uh, a Gerardazos or fight. With, I love this one. Sorry. Fight with cudgels. Well, I'll, I'll let you start because I yeah I have some things to say, but I don't want to I don't want to um, put you into a box. So oh no, I had the wrong one up. That's not the one I was laughing at. <laughs> oh shit! What were you laughing at? I was laughing at the one that looks like a selfie. <laughs> the heads in a landscape. Oh, that heads one. in a landscape. Yeah, that's the um, that's the the. Easter egg of his sorry of his that's black painting that's the, the one I was looking one. at yeah but hold that thought put a pin in that we're gonna go through the main fourteen and then yes we're gonna talk talk about heads in a landscape though I think uh, just to I'm getting a little ahead of myself mm-hmm. I think there is a little bit of a hauntingness to that when they're just they're kind of staring at us this, oh it's the, creepy the viewer it's creepy but let's talk about fight with cudgels first okay I have it now up. fight with cudgels uh, to me is I mean. Uh, uh, let's let's talk about the piece first. Mm-hmm. Just flat is um, at just face value. It's two men fighting, fighting with sticks uh, or clubs. And but I think um, given his history and given um, how he uh, you know looked at yeah the bourgeoisie the the politics at the time I think this is an interpretation of how the upper class makes the lower class fight and divides us so that they can uh, stay in power and I think this you know I feel like this one really spoke to me because to this day we fucking see that you know mm-hmm. like where our um, you know just to touch on modern times for a bit you know when like fucking social media culture and you know all that stuff you know the left and the right it's more divisive now than ever right and uh, i think a lot of that has to do with who is controlling these things and a lot of this kind of propaganda and 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 social and class warfare and it at the end of the day it is the same it's still true that when the top is ma- is dividing the bottom it's so they can stay in power better and longer so i guess we always give a psa on these shows or not always sometimes but like guys 
we got to get along, you know, let's, mm-hmm. let's, <laughs> let's get along. Let's fucking team up. And then you know, maybe we can, we can spread the wealth and the power. Wouldn't that be nice? Wish it was that easy. It's too much <laughs> oh in God. our human condition. There are is a lot of nuances, racism. And yeah, that's a, that's a, that's a topic for another show or mm-hmm. a completely different fucking show. Yeah, no, this one, when I look at it, I, I could so much see his battle between his, the classism, like not classism. Well, yes, classism, but his, the classical painter that he was, but yet he was like the bridge like he started to become into more modern painting. So you see that in the background with the white, like the colors and the foreground and the landscape. And then this really like interesting abstract of these two men fighting, which they said was probably during this about the, the Spanish Civil War. And um, I was reading how it's fight against like the liberals and the absolutists. Did I say that right? Absolutists? Uh, well, well, he was liberal. I think, you know, fighting against the, the conservatives and the people not mm-hmm. wanting to progress, right? And that's exactly what you said. I somebody said something about the. I was reading about the feet. Yeah, the feet. So this is an example of um, painters. Um, yeah, it, it was in different. It was in a different setting, and they had to recreate, or they had to essentially change it for the restoration. So this, how you see it okay. now, is not how it was originally. Uh, originally was on the walls. It, they look like giants. <laughs> just <laughs> when you're looking at, it, like they look like just giants. On their knees fighting in this like landscape when you zoom out well, they're to like it. yeah they're supposed to be in this like muddy you know thing up to their knees i think the original ones had their knees there you know and they were like in these like prairie land like high grasses and he has a lot of blood on him the guy to the left he's like all bloody it's just yeah it's a violent scene it's a violent scene absolutely but but powerful Mm-hmm. Uh, that leads us to number nine, dos, ve- dos vejillos uh, comiendo sopa. Uh, two old ones or two old men eating soup, depending on uh, the literature. This is another, this is uh, much in the vein of uh, two old men, number three on our list. Uh, whereas I, it's, yeah, we have a main character, we'll call it, in the main, as the main subject, a little, a little left and center. And then we have a demonic like entity on the right. And this one to me, I don't know. I actually am a little more scared of the person, you know, because I mean, I I assume they have no teeth. That's how the smile was painted. Mm -hmm. And to me, it's actually more feminine. I actually see this as like an old witch like woman. Um, Yeah, it reminds me of the witch from Snow White. Oh, okay, exactly. Yeah. Yes, that's exactly what it looks like. And it's it's uh, it's I, I there's not a lot to talk about here. It's a haunting, haunting piece of uh very of sinister yeah, yeah very sinister yeah the, the 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 entity on the right doesn't even look alive anymore it, yeah it looks like that's it what has I completely thought. passed you know i thought it was just like he's like i just haven't decided to let go of my friend here he's just been decaying <laughs> for days like whereas that. yeah whereas the and two old men there's action you know you can see it clearly the demon whispering into the to the ear of the man whereas this one it just it's there it's just kind of there. And that um, leads us to uh, number 10, which is the first of the pilgrimage pieces. I'm going to really butcher the Spanish pronunciation, but this one is uh, pilgrimage to the Fountain of San Isidro or the Procession of the Holy Office or just the Holy Office. And uh, this one is showcasing a pilgrimage. He has, uh, this is one of two pieces that just showcase a group of people um, moving as a giant collective body of people on a pilgrimage, moving from one point a to point b and again it's um it's it's showing a lot of people with what because of the style these kind of ghoulish faces like unhuman humans and that's probably where the the steep uh, blackness of the black paintings are here i urge you to read about the history a little more and then you can you can see you can figure out the interpretations but the, these are where the it's a little more tame it's true and it's it's also another classic painting that you like learn about in art school where you're like the foreground and the contrast and depth perception and you know what that's um uh, i think that's a perfect segue to talk about technique so <laughs> less about the analysis and the subject matter and more of so yeah because we have a lot of movement we have a shows actually incredible depth because mm-hmm. we have this huge or not huge this group of people in the foreground and it does get very muddy but we see the figures of people in um the the uh, the background to create that movement and that longevity and it makes your eye really move around the piece especially with the contrast of uh his usual 
uses of blacks and grays and browns and okrays and things like that. And then we have a little blue sky to separate this, assume like a mountainous mass behind the pilgrimage of people. And it, yeah, I feel like this is a master class in, in the fundamentals, if you will, of, of painting. I agree. Okay, let's have fun with number 11 then, which is Sabbath. So which is Sabbath um, or the great he goat is showing a Sabbath of witches <laughs> because uh, so, yeah, the devil is often depicted in art as a giant man like goat creature. Mm -hmm. And this one is almost completely black. You only really see since he's in the foreground a little off to the left. He uh, you see a silhouette of this um, creature talking to this group of people and this is again where we're dealing with the religiosity uh, the, the biblical horror things of that nature but i think i really feel like goya is in the people and seeing the horror horror of the people's faces and things like that this is this is very striking to me too this one this one is very haunting did you see how big this one is it's i didn't see the d actual dimensions massive it's just like the the width of it is absolutely stunning i almost think this hmm. might be one of my favorite ones yeah it's just because i maybe that cliche of loving anything that's like with witches and oh really well, I yeah. don't think we knew that. I've always been really drawn to any type of like witchcraft or mythology in that arena and how they basically like demonize women mm. um, to be these terrible things. But these witches, the, they're this coven or whatever. They're, they're like more scared. Didn't he do another painting that he was did, similar yeah, to He did, yeah. He did a piece, and it's literally called Witch's Sabbath too, where it's it's much more colorful. colorful. It's almost kind of pretty. It's it, Now, that, that piece is almost uh, close to being beautiful. I just pulled it up. Mm -hmm. here it was and just... it's um this one you actually see you know the um the goat creature and this yeah coven of women that are kind of happy to be there whereas yeah that's uh the black paintings version is completely different yeah you should have fun you know anybody listening that really wants to get into this stuff like putting these side by side and seeing the stark difference it almost looks like another painter did it honestly you know so it's it's that striking and good and and, and fascinating i think from a historical context mm -hmm. uh number 12 is um la La Romeria de San Isidro again. So this is the more traditional pilgrimage to San Isidro uh, where we're seeing a lot of the same. This one is more haunting to me because we're seeing more of the people's faces. Um, this The pilgrimage uh, or the group of huddled group of people are on now on the left and we're seeing oh god, the, the faces are, are horrifying. They are like they're singing but yeah. are they like fearful? I'm gonna, it, yeah, it's just so expressive. The pilgrimage, so the th I do know the theory on this one. The pilgrimage is not to a place but to Goya like they're they're coming to uh, I don't think I think there's interpretation to sing his praises but um, it's more of a, a pilgrimage to be a parade for his death we we see that through and through with the the, the pieces here number uh, 12 is uh, vision fantastica fantastica as Maria or just fantastic fantastic vision as it's called in the West this one is yeah he's touching on the mythology and things like that more and now this I feel like this one isn't as haunting. It's more, yeah, it's more surreal, fantastical. And this one, I think, is another master class in terms of fundamentals of art creation with seeing the depth and things like that. A lot of a lot of people, and I agree, he painted in a way to make it look like these two people that are essentially flying, floating, are kind of in front of the piece. Like they're, they're it's almost three dimensional, like they're floating towards you. Yeah, and I also, it, it just does look like, and, they, and I've read about this too, that it's actually actually prometheus going to the the mountain to get is he going see yeah this is what i couldn't find i don't know if he's i thought he was being pulled away uh, because the piece is also called uh, osmodia mm -hmm. and osmodia is like a demon king so yeah either yeah, he's being too. like taken away from the king or he's being dragged to the king and given the themes of the of <laughs> the other pieces i assume it's the latter i think i assume he's being pulled to his to his doom yeah, that's what, because, like, I should know the the Greek mythology of Prometheus by heart, but I know that he gets Well, it's so, oh, my to... God. I, I took uh, Greek and Roman mythology uh, course in college, too, and mm -hmm. I, I love that stuff growing up. What a world, incredible world building and all of these familial connections and things like that. But it mm -hmm. is so complicated it is, and hard yeah. to keep track of every tiny little thing, especially since there's different, um, there's a lot of different naming devices and nomenclature between the Greek and Roman. But yeah, that I, I'm going to go with that. It's Prometheus being 
dragged from the demon, one of the demon kings, to the top of the mountain where he gets his, what, his, like, guts eaten out over and over again? Something mm, like that? Don't know, but that is, ooh, I want to know now. Mm. I think that's the myth. <laughs> uh, so you should have a lot to say about number 14, Tropos, or Las Barcas. Uh, Tropos, or the Fates. What's crazy is I've been playing a video game called um, Returnal, and the planet is called Atropos. And I I realized, okay, this is why it's called that, is because, the well, Atropos is, is one of the Fates, but it's like the goddess of death, I believe. Mm-hmm. And um, she's one of the fates. And uh, that's essentially how the game is designed. It's, it's called what's called a roguelike. So every time you play through a level, it's artificially um, changed. So the map has changed every run through. So it's essentially like, you don't know, it's, it's called R&D in gaming where it's randomized and you don't know what you're going to get. So that's why you're, you're hoping that the fates are on your side or something like that. So it's very appropriately named um but atropos yeah uh, again it's very thematically consistent that uh the goddess of death is coming to well in this piece it's her and her two sisters that are i assume coming after that man uh the far right part of the of the piece that this is uh again a lot of uh, a lot of the same a lot of consistent as i said with his other pieces really great and um i i feel like i had more fun learning about the history of it like atropos and her sisters and what the fate represent and what they are and uh, and the mythology behind them do you remember the cartoon hercules oh yeah do you remember the sisters when they cut the thread i don't is that them that's them that's yeah. them that's the fates okay yeah it's the fates um i actually just watched that movie with the kids at an aftercare at, oh, like perfect. after school and i was like oh there's the greek fates where they cut the thread of life and like the scissor in their hands one of the sisters about mm-hmm. to cut the Probably, yeah, Goya's life. Yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. Well, guys, uh, check out the the mythology there. And then, uh, so that wraps up the uh, traditional 14 that you can see in Spain. And again, there is a a, a hidden uh, 15th painting or or so people think because j- just because it's so perfectly consistent with the how the other 14 pieces look. And I agree, after looking mm-hmm. at it, it is probably the long lost painting of, of this collection. It's Cabezas, uh, Cabezas en un Paseja, or Heads in a Landscape. And um, I think this one's actually pretty haunting uh, because it uh, all of the heads in the landscape are in the bottom right hand corner and it's, it's painted so they're staring directly at you. It's one of those, mm-hmm. you know, it's one of those uh, optical illusions where, where it doesn't matter where you stand, they're going to be staring at you. Just like the the famous gun, like when a gun is pointed at you in a painting, it doesn't matter where you stand, you're going to be pointed. It's going to be directed right at you in terms of your optics and vision. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm scared just looking at it on my computer screen. I know, I'm looking at it right now and I'm like, oh God, this is yeah. so, so daunting. It's so interesting, the contrast with all these people in the corner. I laugh because I read somewhere, it's like the original self and I'm like that's hilarious <laughs> so uh bring us on home miss parsons uh let's tie a bow on this b y study as much as this uh conversation uh, jesus christ was a little bleak i know thanks for guys if you're still here uh thanks for uh pulling through bearing with us to get to the conclusion um why study the black paintings though i believe it's like an entryway into the psyche between a man's own creative myth you're also seeing into the fact that this was never meant to be seen and a lot of people paint things to create things for it to be seen or to be sold so this really is getting into his reflection into someone's mind and he really was the precursor for you know surrealism and modernism so he's very important because he's the link between the great classics you worded that so well the great classics to the future like the modern modern painting so he's very very important to learn about and these especially these black paintings were a segue into those absolutely he's he's a bridge he's a bridge into what a lot of historians call uh the bridge to expressionism uh that whole era of uh of painters and culture and things like that and uh before we get into our outros um a little um a little post easter egg fun fact for you guys just to end on more of a fun note um so he is also the very 
very first painter to paint a nude that was more sexually focused or explicit in nature instead of like a nude that was depicting a story or things like that we've had nudes for probably since the dawn of time since uh, people could create a painting you know on a wall or something like that with the stick figure right his piece uh, Le, there's two versions of this too there's La Meja Desnuda and La Meja Vestada and it's showing a a, a lovely woman uh, on like a like a couch type of piece of furniture but it's not you know it's 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 a nude to be uh, more uh, sexually explicit. It was uh, described as the very first totally profane life-size female nude in Western art of all time. Did not know that. That's so cool. Uh, guys, thank you for listening. I appreciate you hanging on with us on this one. Of course, I want to uh, thank my guest, Miss Parsons. But uh, before we go, of course, you know, we got a little extra for you, a little icing on top, a little cherry uh, for that Sunday with what we call the gym of the week. If you're new to the show and don't know what the gym of the week is, it's something we like to talk about here at the end of our shows to highlight, but it doesn't really fit into the scheme of the main topic, you know, because it may just be on our radar in the last day, last week, or maybe last month, but we want to give it to you guys so you guys can dig deeper. Now, uh, before we go into them, of course, we need to hear about their sponsor. Gyms this week are sponsored by Zencaster. Zencaster is our go-to tool for remote podcast recordings. What's great is that you can record so separate audio and video tracks. And it's all backed up on a secured cloud, so you never lose your hard work. Even better, it's easy to use and there's nothing to download. So go to zen.ai, that's z-e-n.ai slash art of the beholder, or just use promo code art of the beholder and get 30% off your first three months with a pro account. Now back to the gyms. Mine is, um, I've already talked about one, but uh, I'm going to I'm gonna keep it short and sweet. So Returnal is uh, a game, uh, a video game that actually Ryan has talked about in the gyms and I just got finally got around to playing. It is a fucking challenge. It, it's not going to hold your hand. It's rage quitting hard. You're going to hate yourself sometimes for playing it. But once you get past things, you'll, you'll really feel like you succeeded in something. Uh, and then what's crazy is my wife loves Ink Master, which is the show um, about tattoo art. And um, they just renewed um, the show for a season 14. And in episode two, there was this, what was so fitting, this just happened. I, I think this is the, the most recent episode as the, as the time of this recording is they had a competition where a canvas, so the person got to pick what they wanted, you know, like I want X, Y, and Z on my shoulder or whatever, but they had to do it in the style of a famous artist from history. And Goya was one of them. And they actually showed a picture of, of Saturn devouring his son. And so uh, she had to, this poor tattoo artist had to tattoo what he wanted on his on his body, but in the style of Goya. And then they, they also, you know, someone had the style of Picasso with Cubism or the style of Dolly or something like that. So that was a really cool episode to see. And then last but not least is uh, Cult of, since we've been talking about fucking, you know, demonology and religiosity and all that, those kind of biblical things is uh, there's a, <laughs> there's a game called Cult of the Lamb, which takes very cutesy art style. Uh, it's a video game that uses, yeah, really cutesy art style. And you play as a little cute little lamb that uh, died, went to, I assume, hell in this universe and was erected, resurrected by a demon and you create your own cult. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I want to play you, this game. <laughs> you create your own cult and you build this cult to essentially um, try to resurrect this demon that saved you from death. And But what's crazy is, yeah, so it's really dark, witch-like, fucking pentagrams everywhere kind of subject matter. But the art style is really cute. Everything's like really sweet and cute and, and, and cuddly. You want to like take them out of the screen. How and, interesting. You know, I want to play. That looks yeah. so fun. Yeah, it's absolutely fun. Uh, Ms. Parsons, what do you got for us? My little gem of the week is, and I think it's absolutely um, outstanding and I'm really happy and thrilled that it is on Prime now. It is um, The Power of the Rings, which is the new oh, Lord okay. of the Rings. I was, um, ooh, I was on the fence. Sell it to me. Cinematography, it is absolutely stunning. It's beautiful. Yeah. And it is supposed to be the one most expensive shows ever like made. A billion dollars or something right yeah That's meanwhile true. people are like starving um but oh, it yeah. is don't get me it, started <laughs> it's living Fucking up to Christ. it and they're doing like show off pieces like there's a slow motion of her uh like riding one of the Gladria's character is riding a horse in slow motion with her beautiful gown and i'm like okay y'all are just like showing off now 
it's just really <laughs> stunning, visually beautiful. I'm sure it's going to win a lot of awards. Or so Emmys. is the is the um, so it looks beautiful, but is the show good? It is good. It takes a little, you know. I think we're all very attached to um, the trilogy, Lord trilogy, Lord. and who actually played Galadria. Galadria um, actually played her, which was um, mm. one of my favorite actresses, Kate Blanchett. Oh, Kate Blanchett. Okay. She played, you know, the they called her the witch in the woods, you know, the hobbits mm. and stuff like that. But she's the elder. She's one of the original elves. And if you, um, I've read some of the Similarion, and I'm probably butchering that name. The Similarion on that book from um, our Tolkien is that uh, it's very red like a text like biblical it's just very boring to read so it is really nice to watch this and see it in like this um very theatrical way where like, i'm like oh yeah you see i don't want to give anything away but there's these things that he talks about in the book and then they're making it so beautiful so i think hmm. it's it's nice to see where these these came from it takes like a couple thousand like a thousand years before Lord um, Lord of the Rings. Interesting. It's like, it's important. It's like when the stories that they talked about in Lord of the Rings where Saruman fights, they fight for Middle Earth and elves and man and everybody fight together. And like, that's, it was when the rings were forged. It's all about how they're forged. So it's, very fascinating i'm very excited to see where it goes all right guys check it out and if you like that of course you could check out some of our products at novodayproductions.com there you'll find things like the entropy sessions as already stated uh adulteration post meridium cancel culture lotto of course this show you'll see ads for this if you want to check out some of our ep- other episodes and a lot more to come so uh, don't forget to like and subscribe and do all the things. You know, I was thinking about this today since we kind of make fun of this process. I, I, I think I make fun of it because, you know, you, you should already know what to fucking do by now. OK, I call it I call it Internet or social media etiquette where it's like, OK, where if, if we have a thing, uh, if you like it, subscribe. Yeah, would, I don't think we have to tell people anymore, I guess is why I make mm-hmm. fun of it every week. But I, of course, I'm going to keep doing it. Uh, and the other thing is the other etiquette is a spoilers. Like don't click on the thing that has the title about the thing you're interested in before seeing the thing, you know, there's going to be spoilers. <laughs> it's etiquette. Like don't it's why do we have to say spoilers anymore? Right. I'm like, what is the point of that? So that's my Good little point. fucking, yeah, my little soapbox. <laughs> Good point. So with that being said, don't forget to like and subscribe and <laughs> Hit that notification bell and do all the things. Rate yes, review. please. Yes, thank you. Uh, and if you'd like to sponsor our little love child here, you can reach out to reach out to us at uh, novadaymedia at gmail.com. If you want to get a hold of Miss Alexandra Parsons, tell the good people how to get a hold of you. Alexandra underscore Parsons at um, IG. That's where you could find me. My Etsy account and link is all on there. Just keep it easy and simple. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> <laughs> but until next time, guys, be good to each other. And as always, good luck and Godspeed. We love you. Art of the Beholder is brought to you by Novo Day Productions. Created and hosted by Novo Day and the Novo Day Collective. Facebook.com slash Novo Day Media. At Novo Day Media on Twitter and Instagram. Music by A Company. Facebook.com slash Aco Music 123. Aco on Spotify. Logo designed by Tom Justice, J-E-S-T-U-S, of thejusticecompany.com, and executively produced by Clayton Anderson. All rights reserved.